Harry Potter is a series that goes from a children's book in the Sorcerer's Stone to a story that fits pretty squarely in the young adult category by the time Deathly Hallows came out. For many millennials like myself, I grew up at a similar pace as Harry, Ron, and Hermione, going through similar life stages at the same time. Minus, of course, being a wizard and learning magic and having a homicidal maniac set on my destruction and all of that. But at some point, that series made a transition, becoming more serious, dealing with real-world issues and death. I'd argue there's no clearer turning point for this than the introduction of Dementors. This is a new series that I'm starting, and if I'm doing it correctly, there are plenty more videos on the way. I'll be exploring niche parts of the Harry Potter world, one topic at a time, from creatures like Dementors all the way to the concept of death itself. No detail is too far in the weeds, and no fan theory is off limits. Before we jump in, like the video, subscribe if you want more of this content, and leave a comment with your favorite magical creature in the Harry Potter world. I'll do my best to include some of the best suggestions in the future deep dives. It could be anything from Dementors to the Basilisk. I don't know, maybe you like pixies or something. I'm not judging, whatever floats your boat. Okay, without further ado, think of your happiest memory and let's go chase some Dementors. Alright, maybe this is a bit of a hot take, but honestly, if there's anything that the movies did right, I think that it was putting an image to some of the wild creatures in the series. I'm not totally sure about the beasts in Newt Scamander's Magical Adventures, maybe I'm the only one, but to me, those felt way more CGI-like. Maybe it's the nostalgia talking, I don't know. Anyways, what better place to start than Harry's first encounter with a Dementor, all the way back in the Prisoner of Azkaban. Standing in the doorway, illuminated by the shivering flames of Lupin's hand, was a cloaked figure that towered to the ceiling. Its face was completely hidden behind its hood. Harry's eyes darted downward, and what he saw made his stomach contract. There was a hand protruding from the cloak, and it was glistening, grayish, slimy looking, and scabbed like something dead that had decayed in water. But it was visible only for a split second, as though the creature beneath the cloak sensed Harry's gaze, the hand was suddenly withdrawn into the folds of its black cloak. I'm gonna come back to this part about the hand being withdrawn. Maybe it's nothing, but it seems relevant to me. But this is only our first encounter. Harry, of course, has several more run-ins with the mentors throughout his stay at Hogwarts. At times, getting closer than just about any human ever has, and living to tell the tale, like at the end of Prisoner of Azkaban. He could feel them watching him, hear their rattling breath like an evil wind around him. The nearest Dementor seemed to be considering him, then it raised both of its rotting hands and lowered its hood. Where there shouldn't have been eyes, there was only thin, gray, scabbed skin, stretched blankly over empty sockets. But there was a mouth, a gaping, shapeless hole, sucking the air with the sound of a death rattle. Now, despite appearances, Dementors do seem to be corporeal. That is, they have bodies. Ten-foot-tall ones, apparently. They are physical beings, they aren't some form of ghost, and we know this because of one of the strangest images I can conjure up, Dementors doing manual labor. Sirius Black explains as much in Goblet of Fire when he describes what we eventually learn is Barty Crouch Jr.'s mom disguised as her son. Crouch never came for his son's body. The Dementors buried him outside the fortress. I watched them do it. This isn't the only instance of physical labor. We know that they also deliver food to the prisoners in Azkaban, but I guess what we don't know is, do they use their hands? I just can't really picture them holding a shovel and digging a grave very effectively, or carrying a tray of food to a prison cell without dropping it. They Maybe they use magic to do tasks, I guess, but that would put them closer to something like a house elf who has some form of sapience and an ability to cast magic. Food for thought, because I want to get into that whole sapience question in a moment. 
Lastly, I wasn't sure which section to include this in, but they also seem to have the ability to suck both the light and heat out of a space. Though, seeing as these are basically a literary representation of depression, I'm not sure if that effect is physically happening or only happening in the victim's head. It makes me wonder if maybe wizard inventors could capture a Dementor and make use of them somehow, like put them in a wizard refrigerator or something. Do they have fridges? I don't know. They don't have electricity, so they must keep things cold with magic, right? Does the wizarding world have entropy? If they use a fridge to keep things cold, does that mean somewhere something else is getting hotter? I honestly wonder if there's a whole video to be done based on the physics of Harry Potter magic, but I'll add that to the list and it'll come out sometime in the future. Let's table that discussion about depression for a moment and instead talk about something a little bit easier. Consciousness, sentience, and sapience. <clears throat> the interesting thing to me about Dementors is that different characters seem to have different opinions about them. Some, like Lupin, describe Dementors as basically feral animals. Dementors are among the foulest creatures that walk this earth. They infest the darkest, filthiest places. They glory in decay and despair. They drain peace, hope, and happiness out of the air around them. While others, like Umbridge or eventually Voldemort, use them as tools, or in another sense, as soldiers, doing grunt work or enforcing the rules of their master. Even Lupin is seen communicating with them. I'm going to make the point that I think Dementors are much closer to humans than they are to animals, and potentially much smarter than we might give them credit for. Starting with consciousness, I'm not even going to pull a quote for this one because I think it's all but obvious. This is basically just basic awareness, existing in an environment and reacting to it. Plants are not conscious, but most animals are, excluding maybe insects and crabs and whatnot, but I, I don't know, you guys can debate about that. They're very clearly at least conscious. Now, I move up one level to sentience, a step above consciousness, it's a step below sapience. Researching sentience right now is kind of a minefield of conversations about AI and chat GPT, but I think we can come to an agreement that sentience is basically consciousness plus the capacity to feel emotions like pleasure, pain, fear, etc. and act on them we would consider many animals as sentient, so I think it's pretty clear that Dementors would clear the bar as well. And we can come to this conclusion based on Dumbledore's description of them in Prisoner of Azkaban. He says, It is not in the nature of a Dementor to understand pleading or excuses. I therefore warn each and every one of you to give them no reason to harm you. You can probably draw more conclusions from this line than just sentience, but let's start small. They clearly act on emotional stimuli. You'd be hard pressed to argue that they aren't sentient. They make decisions based on their desire to suck out your soul, which clearly makes them happy. So, you know, chase your bliss and all of that. But one more level up and we have sapience. And here's where things start to get interesting. I think of sapiens as a circle that also includes sentience and within sentience, basic consciousness. So it's basically like the free plan versus the beginner plan versus the pro plan diagram on a website. Sapiens critically involves the capacity for reason, abstract thought, planning. There are no animals, strictly speaking, that the scientific community considers sapient. Great apes, dolphins, and elephants, among others, may be close, but they, debatably, I'll agree, lack some of the hallmarks of humans. Complex language and abstract reasoning, for example. But again, I'm sure people have different opinions there. Let's start with communication. We actually see communication attempted with the mentors in our very first encounter with them. It happens very briefly, but when Harry wakes up after passing out, Ron, Hermione, and Neville explain what happened while he was taking a little nap. And Professor Lupin stepped over you and walked toward the Dementor and pulled out his wand, said Hermione, and he said, None of us is hiding Sirius Black under our cloaks. Go. 
But the mentor didn't move, so Lupin muttered something, and a silvery thing shot out of his wand at it, and it turned around and sort of glided away. So not only do we have the first foreshadowing of the Patronus, go back and check my latest video on foreshadowing if you want more of that, we also have a straight up verbal communication with them. Dumbledore also explains soon after the students arrive at Hogwarts about the nature of Dementors. It's that same quote that I already read that it's not in the nature of a Dementor to understand pleading or excuses. And I guess it depends on how you read this, and it might mean different things to different people. Is Dumbledore saying that A, the Dementors literally won't understand you because they are brainless animals, or B, what I find to be the more likely answer is that they are merely ruthless. It's not that they don't understand, they just don't care. Leading me into my final argument that Dementors are sapient, logical beings, and it comes from the opening scene of the Half-Blood Prince. Fudge is visiting with the then Prime Minister, who in case you didn't remember is one of the muggles that is allowed to know about the wizarding world. He tells them all about the current Voldemort situation, but also has one little nugget in there that's fascinating. And as if all that wasn't enough, said Fudge, barely listening to the Prime Minister, we've got Dementors swarming all over the place, attacking people left, right, and center. Once upon a happier time, this sentence would have been unintelligible to the Prime Minister, but he was wiser now. I thought Dementors guard the prisoners in Azkaban, he said cautiously. They did, said Fudge warily, but not anymore. They've deserted the prison and joined he who must not be named. I won't pretend that it wasn't a blow. Hmm. Deserted the prison and joined Voldemort, huh? That doesn't really sound like something an animal would choose to do. Dogs don't reason with logic and switch sides in a war like mercenaries. In fact, I'd say that when Dementors are part of a scene, they're described in a way that's much more like a soldier for hire than a rabid animal. Sure, they might not be very eloquent with that mouth of theirs, but I think there's a pretty solid case to be made that Dementors are basically really bad floating people that suck the joy out of a room. So basically, just like that one friend of yours that got really into crypto and NFTs last year, same thing. And speaking of tricks and magic, let's talk a little bit more about the Dementors powers. Aside from sucking the joy and happiness out of a room, they also have a trump card that only gets worse the more you read about it. The Dementors Kiss. Though I'll be honest, through my entire reading of the series as a kid, I'm not sure I really paid too much attention to the Dementors Kiss. I know everyone calls it a state worse than death, but I pretty much just equated it with dying. I don't really think I'm alone in that though, I, it was basically just game over, whether that meant death or something else entirely. And before I dive into the actual theory and lore of the Dementor's kiss, let's remind ourselves with Lupin's description of it. They call it the Dementor's kiss, said Lupin with a slightly twisted smile. It's what Dementors do to those they wish to destroy utterly. I suppose there must be some kind of mouth under there because they clamp their jaws upon the mouth of the victim and and suck out his soul. Harry accidentally spat out a bunch of butterbeer. What? They kill? Oh no, said Lupin, much worse than that. You can exist without your soul, you know, as long as your brain and heart are still working, but you'll have no sense of self anymore, no memory, no anything. There's no chance at all of recovery. You'll just exist as an empty shell and your soul is gone forever, lost. I think part of the reason this didn't have as much weight to me as a kid is because it really doesn't get talked about many other times. We hear about it being a fate worse than death and then the rest of the encounters with the mentors are focused on defeating them like any other random enemy not something that could potentially trap your soul inside themselves in a state worse than purgatory for eternity? Yeah, that's right, they trap your soul. Did you know that? As I was researching what actually happens to your soul, 
I came to the realization that I had never considered the aftermath of the Dementor's kiss. I had assumed, maybe incorrectly, that your soul was sort of destroyed in the process. Instead, replace the word suck with consume. Dementors quite literally consume the soul, and despite some evidence that you can kill them, which we'll get to later, that doesn't seem to happen very often. Meaning, after all this explanation, that once you receive the Dementor's kiss, your soul might just be bouncing around inside a Dementor, forever. Now, seeing as the Dementors are completely blind, we have to talk about their other critical ability, which also seems to be their method of navigation at the same time. The ability to sense emotion. Specifically, it seems to apply exclusively to human emotions, as evidenced by Sirius Black's Animagus... Animagus? <laughs> you guys are gonna kill me for this. Animagus evasion tactics. I don't know how I did it, he said slowly. I think the only reason I never lost my mind is that I knew I was innocent. That wasn't a happy thought, so the Dementors couldn't suck it out of me. But it kept me sane and knowing who I am, helped me keep my powers. So when it all became too much, I could transform in my cell, become a dog. Dementors can't see, you know. He swallowed. They feel their way toward people by feeding off their emotions. They could tell that my feelings were less, less human, less complex when I was a dog. But they thought, of course, that I was losing my mind like everyone else in there, so it didn't trouble them. But I was weak, very weak. And I had no hope of driving them away from me without a wand. There's a lot in that quote, some of which I'm going to come back to later. But for now, suffice to say that Dementors seem to only be interested on the happy thoughts of humans. It also explains how they would be immune to the concealing effects of Harry's invisibility cloak, as Dumbledore warns against trying to sneak past them. They are stationed at every entrance to the grounds, Dumbledore continued, and while they are with us, I must make it plain that nobody is to leave school without permission. Dementors are not to be fooled by tricks, or disguises, or even invisibility cloaks," he added blandly, and Harry and Ron glanced at each other. And we do actually see Harry sneaking past them in the Deathly Hallows under his cloak of invisibility. It happens to work in this instance, but it's likely because he's surrounded by a bunch of other humans in close proximity. Moving through the towering black figures was terrifying. The eyeless faces hidden beneath their hoods turned as he passed, and he felt sure that they sensed him. Sensed, perhaps, a human presence that still had some hope, some resilience. But now that we've discussed what they look like, how they act, and what they can do, let's move on and figure out where they even came from in the first place. As far as the inspiration of Dementors go, there seems to be a pretty clear-cut answer from J.K. Rowling in an interview from the year 2000, directly before Book 4, The Goblet of Fire, came out. The interviewer makes the assertion that Dementors are a description of depression, to which J.K. Rowling responds, Yes, that is exactly what they are, she says. It was entirely conscious, and entirely from my own experience. Depression is the most unpleasant thing I have ever experienced. It is that absence of being able to envisage that you will ever be cheerful again. The absence of hope. The very deadened feeling, which is so very different from feeling sad. Sad hurts, but it's a healthy feeling. It's a necessary thing to feel. Depression is very different. Certainly, J.K. Rowling is not the first author or storyteller to come up with a creature that feeds on the souls of humans, so I dug in a little bit more on a couple of similar tales. J.K. Rowling's Dementors may be the first that's based purely on the idea of depression, but negative emotions being the driving force behind these creatures is not completely uncommon. Take for instance the Impa Shilap, I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's a figure from the myths of the indigenous Chakta tribe of the southeast US. As best as I can tell, Impa Shilap translates literally to soul eater. It's a horrifying creature that would crawl inside your mind if you allowed evil thoughts or depression to take over your mind. And once inside, 
it would devour your soul. Another example that I've seen brought up is the Drokkar, a fantasy monster from Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time series. I have not even started reading the series, I can't imagine when I will ever have the time to read it, but maybe some of you have. Regardless, the Drakkar is basically a vampire type creature, however, if you check the description from what I believe is the second book, it's not hard to see the resemblance. She only felt a vague sadness as she stepped towards the creature. The deep crooning that drew her closer suppressed feeling. White, white hands like a man's hands but tipped with claws reached for her, and lips the color of blood curved into a travesty of a smile, bearing sharp teeth but dimly, so dimly, she knew that it would not bite or tear. Fear the Draugr's kiss. Once those lips touched her, she would be as good as dead, to be drained of a soul and then life. I mean, it's pretty uncanny, and this book came out in 1990, so anyways, you'll have to let me know. I, have any of you read this book? I'm sure plenty of you have, I just haven't gotten around to starting it. Give me your reviews in the comments or something, I, I would like to start it, just don't know when I'll be able to. Moving on, the world history of Dementors is not something that necessarily has a clear-cut answer. It's also fraught with the ever-expanding Harry Potter universe. There are a couple characters that don't really appear in the original series that got added after the fact in different spin-off material, and frankly, I'm not sure where I stand on how canon those things are. Listen, I'm not one to really get too caught up in what's quote-unquote canon, but it does feel a little strange to me when it comes with the additional material that's, you know, some kind of weird cash grab. I'm not sure. Where do you draw the line on canon versus non-canon? Is it the books only, the movies, spin-off games, the trading card game? I don't know. Regardless, there are a couple of stories from the spin-off material that involve two ancient wizards that seem to be the first documented instances of Dementors. I'm not really going to go into them right now because I don't think it's super interesting, but suffice to say, neither Dark Wizard, neither Raxidian, nor Akristus seem to have invented Dementors. They just seem to harness them. No, Dementors don't seem to grow in numbers, at least not like a normal animal. Instead, it's compared more to mold spreading. And in an early 2000s interview, J.K. Rowling was asked how Dementors breed. She had this to say about it. These evil creatures don't, by the way, breed, but grow like fungus where there is decay. I think the best comparison I saw was to the creation of poltergeists like Peeves, which J.K. Rowling calls a, quote, indestructible spirit of chaos, it distinctly pointing out that Peeves is not a ghost of a once living person, he's something completely separate. Other sources talk about the creation of poltergeists being driven by a high concentration of mischief in a small area. So, if anything, Dementors seem to be a cousin to poltergeists, and rather than being created, they emerge from conditions of decay. In this instance, I think JK Rowling is meaning decay in the emotional sense, depression, despair, and so on, but I do wonder about the implication that they're born out of actual physical decay and it has me piecing together a pretty wild theory. So let's hop right into it along with several other fan theories that sucked me in. All right, I'll pick up where I left off. We were just talking about the comparisons that are made to Dementors and Fungus. And while constant contact with certain fungi can certainly be harmful to humans, think black mold, rotting food, etc., it does play a pretty crucial role in the ecosystem. So, I'm not saying Dementors are necessarily good, but what if they aren't bad? When you see mushrooms out in the wild, you don't necessarily ascribe some sort of morality to them, they just exist and play a role in breaking down organic material. What if, then it's a big what if, but stick with me, what if Dementors play a similar role? Yes, when they are in contact with humans, it's definitely bad, but maybe it isn't their fault, so to speak. It's just what they do. Dementors spring up in areas of intense emotion and play some role in consuming it, cycling it back into something else. 
Perhaps they are less of an evil entity and more of a misunderstood force of nature. You might be saying, well, sure, but they feed on positive emotion, don't they? And you're right, they do. But if we keep this analogy going, maybe that positive emotion is sort of like sugar to fungus, and Dementors are not so much attacking people as they are seeking out a high energy food source. Again, maybe this is all a stretch, but what if Dementors are just maintaining a sort of emotional equilibrium, smoothing out the emotional peaks around them, an ecologically neutral force, neither good nor evil? Where would the Patronus come into play though? I'm not totally sure, but I'm gonna dive even deeper down this rabbit hole for a second. This got me thinking about how Dementors are formed, and that the Harry Potter universe has several creatures that spawn from negative emotions. But what about positive emotions? What if, and here's an even bigger what if, Patronuses are in some way naturally occurring, the sort of emotional opposite of a Dementor. In essence, they cancel each other out. They may be exceedingly rare in nature and thus immensely powerful when compared to a single Dementor, but a powerful enough wizard is able to use magic to concentrate positive emotion densely enough to create one. So what if Dementors aren't evil, but more like a natural force, balancing out emotional extremes like nature's cleanup crew for negative energy, negative vibes, and maybe Patronuses are their natural opposites a rare, powerful force created by pure positive emotion. Maybe instead of a battle of good versus evil, it's just two sides of the same magical coin. On to another theory that gets hinted at in the Deathly Hallows and is roughly connected to the previous idea. Harry is walking through the ministry when Dementors are being used in interrogations. The petrified Muggleborns brought in for questioning sat huddled and shivering on hard wooden benches. Most of them were hiding their faces in their hands, perhaps in an instinctive attempt to shield themselves from the Dementors' greedy mouths. What I found interesting was this idea that people instinctively shielded themselves from the Dementors. I think it's pretty safe to assume that most people in the wizarding world would not have had any encounters with Dementors. So for them to be reacting in a similar manner would imply that it's something ingrained in human DNA, originating long before modern society existed. So if you are following the theory train here, that would imply that humans and Dementors may have coexisted starting a long time ago. Okay. Maybe not coexisted, but it might imply that they were at very least a real threat to humans early on in our evolutionary timeline. In the same way that many humans have the same primal fear of animals like spiders and snakes, there's no reason to think that in the Harry Potter world, those primal fears might extend to some magical creatures as well, such as Dementors. With that in mind, the reaction of putting their head in their hands is an interesting one. Maybe in the early days before a wizard could consistently produce a Patronus charm, the most effective way to combat a Dementor was to cower in fear. We don't really know how physically strong a Dementor is, even though there is a scene in the movie version of Order of the Phoenix where a Dementor lifts Harry off the ground. That never happens in the books, they seem more like vultures in the books, swooping in at the opportune moment to attack their victim. So maybe this small line hints at a long shared history between humanity and Dementors. Though I wouldn't be surprised if their weaponization by humanity was a relatively recent development. Another question that comes up here is whether or not you can kill a Dementor. Now, most sources describe them as being amortal. That is, they can't really be created or killed because they weren't living in the first place. Again, similar to a poltergeist. But J.K. Rowling does talk about limiting their number in an interview from 2007, so right after the final book was released. You cannot destroy Dementors, though you can limit their numbers if you eradicate the conditions in which they multiply, i.e. despair and degradation. Yet again, I can't help but relate this back to the fungus idea. She mentions being able to limit their numbers, but she doesn't really illuminate if that means destroying them 
or just slowing down an ever-increasing population. I find that hard to believe. If you could truly never destroy a Dementor, the world would surely be overrun with them, if not in a few decades, certainly over a period of centuries or millennia. I have to assume that when she said limiting their numbers, it means that there is in fact a way to make their population decrease. But it might not be through physically destroying them. Instead, I would guess it would be more akin to starving them. You can obviously herd Dementors to some extent with the use of multiple Patronus spells. In Order of the Phoenix, Harry verbally commands his Patronus to go after the one attacking Dudley. So given the time and space, I'm sure multiple witches and wizards in a controlled environment could herd them like sheepdog. So imagine you push all the Dementors into a small space and over time, improve the conditions there, or rather remove all the sadness and decay. Maybe that's by taking humans out of the equation, or maybe that's through putting a boombox in there with like only happy music, I don't know. But if you were able to essentially starve them, maybe that's your only chance at destroying them. Thoughts on this? It's hard to think too much about this because I'm probably scrutinizing a plot mechanic more than it deserves, but that's what these videos are for, right? A couple more theories to go, but they are loosely tied together. First, why in the world is Harry so susceptible to Dementors? You'll recall that Lupin finds a boggart for Harry to practice Expecto Patronum on prior to actually having to deal with the real thing. Another boggart, said Lupin, stripping off his cloak. I've been combing the castle ever since Tuesday, and very luckily I found this one lurking inside Mr. Filch's filing cabinet. It's the nearest we'll get to a real Dementor. The Boggart will turn into a Dementor when he sees you, so we'll be able to practice on him. I can storm in my office when we're not using him. There's a cupboard under my desk that he'll like. Now, I really want to make a whole nother video deep diving Boggarts, but suffice to say for now, Lupin must have known that the Boggart would produce a less powerful Dementor. Whether it can fully copy the Dementor's abilities seems like an open question, but at the very least, it would be weaker. It would be otherwise insane for Lupin to risk killing Harry unless he knew that it wasn't actually a real risk. That said, even this weaker Bogart Dementor still manages to knock Harry out several times, and very quickly, something that not even the real Dementor on the train did to Ron, Hermione, and Neville. Despite, at the very least, Neville having plenty of food for the Dementor to feast on. So, why does Harry get the brunt of the attack? Or rather, why is he so susceptible? I can't really take credit for this theory. It's obviously been going around the internet for as long as there have been Harry Potter forums. So, a long time. But in a nutshell, it has to do with the fact that Harry has a piece of Voldemort's soul inside of him. Dementors are essentially getting a double helping of soul pie whenever they attack Harry. Madame Pomfrey gives us a little bit of flavor around this when she checks in Harry to the clinic. Setting Dementors around a school, she muttered, pushing back Harry's hair and feeling his forehead. He won't be the last one who collapses. Yes, he's all clammy, terrible things they are, and the effect they have on people who are already so delicate. I think delicate is an interesting word choice here. Sure, for the reader, it's meant to be interpreted as a sort of emotional delicacy, but in hindsight, you have to wonder if it's talking about the delicacy of Harry and Voldemort's intertwined souls. Which leads me into the final question and theory. How susceptible is Voldemort to a Dementor attack? The quick answer is of course he is. He's still human in some ways, Dementors could still attack him, and he still has a soul, even if it's split into multiple parts. But even while I say that, it honestly brings up another question. Could Dementors destroy or swallow a Horcrux? We're in super tangent land, but I have to wonder if a Dementor had attacked Harry and successfully kissed away his soul, what would that have meant for the piece of Voldemort's soul inside him? Would that have been like the most anticlimactic ending to the story? Dumbledore successfully hunts down all the Horcruxes and kills Voldemort, but the one final piece of his soul is stuck in a Dementor? out of reach for eternity? Wouldn't that also make Voldemort immortal? 
honestly, too many questions here. So give me your input on that, but let's get back on track. Would the Dementors attack Voldemort in the first place? I think the answer is no. They do seem to be taking orders from him in the final couple books, but that kind of sidesteps the question of could they attack him? It's documented in a few places that Dark Wizards, Voldemort being darkest of them all, are incapable of summoning a Patronus, which would leave Voldemort defenseless against a Dementor, wouldn't it? Well, that depends on if you think the Patronus is the only way to fight a Dementor, but based on a single throwaway line in the Half-Blood Prince, that doesn't seem to be the case. Harry fully expected to receive low marks on his because he had disagreed with Snape on the best way to tackle Dementors, but he did not care. Slughorn's memory was the most important thing to him now. Leading us to the final part of this question. If Voldemort can't cast a Patronus and Snape disagrees with Harry on the best way to combat a Dementor, how else would one do that? Perhaps the hint is that Snape, one of the greatest Occlumens known to the wizarding world, is the one that disagrees with Harry. The theory is a bit counterintuitive, but that's why I kind of love it. In order to cast a Patronus, you have to focus on a powerfully happy memory. But in doing so, what if you're actually enticing the Dementor, teasing it with something so happy it just can't help but attack you? Instead, I wonder if Snape's preferred method would be complete and total control over your emotions and thoughts. In short, Occlumency. If you don't have any emotions or positive feelings for a Dementor to latch onto, maybe it would just ignore you. In Deathly Hallows, while Harry is under the cloak and walking through the Dementors, he thinks that they can sense him. He mentions that they must be able to sense his presence, his hope, maybe his resilience. Right before this quote, Harry is desperately trying to think of happy thoughts, anchoring himself to Ron and Hermione, and stopping himself from casting a Patronus. Perhaps Snape's advice here would be to completely neutralize your emotions in this case, basically become a walking zombie, and the Dementors might not even know that you're there in the first place. So bringing this full circle, we know that Voldemort is also a highly skilled Occlumens, second only maybe to Snape himself. Maybe this would be Voldemort's preferred method of countering a Dementor attack. All that said, it's also possible that A, the Dementors wouldn't even sense what tiny sliver of a soul is left in Voldemort, B, his soul might not have any positive emotion left in it, period, which seems to be the consensus, but I disagree that's really possible, or C, maybe you really can just play the powerful wizard card and shoot some crazy fireball out of your wand to destroy it. I don't know. Speaking of destroying things, let's move on to some plot holes that may or may not destroy your immersion in this story. Starting with something that undermines most of how Dementors are countered in the wizarding world, the Patronus charm. It just shouldn't work. Let's also forget all the theory crafting from the previous section, we're turning over a new leaf here. According to all the lore in the series, it is a projection of the caster's most positive feelings, something that Dementors love. They cannot get enough of those positive feelings. So shouldn't a Patronus be like a feast to them? I suppose the counter to this argument is that a properly cast Patronus is able to overwhelm the Dementors in question like trying to give them too much food at once, they would just be driven away instead. It feels though like a more effective counter to Dementors would either be to control all your emotions like we discussed with Snape, or a spell that would just conceal you, your emotions and all. They can't attack something that they can't sense, so I'm surprised there isn't a spell that otherwise blocks the transmission of emotions and thoughts. I know that's very similar to Occlumency, like Snape, but I'm meaning this to be something distinct. A spell cast over an individual, just like how you might cast a spell to turn yourself invisible. You should also be able to cast a spell that turns off or hides your emotions and thoughts. The second plot hole to bring up involves the Dementor population. We've discussed at length the fact that they are a mortal. We've even discussed the mention of controlling their numbers. but. 
even with that, I think we have an issue. Maybe you can control the numbers when you're aware of them. The Ministry of Magic has control of the Dementors that work for them because Azkaban is right next to them. They can see them, they can control them, they can probably make some sort of magical tool that casts a constant Patronus and it works like an invisible fence for a dog, I don't know. Wizard technology could be cool if they weren't so dumb. <clears throat> so, uh, maybe they can control the Dementors that they can see, but what about the free-range Dementors? The ones that might appear in the countryside? There are certainly other areas in the world where the conditions are right for Dementors to appear. Couldn't they also spread uncontrollably there? What if, for instance, they appeared in an area that didn't really have many witches or wizards? How are human beings supposed to fight off these creatures without a Patronus of their own? Is, like, putting on YouTube videos of Bob Ross the muggle equivalent of casting a Patronus? Maybe taking an antidepressant of some kind would affect them? I don't know. There's lots of questions and not really any answers. If Dementors were able to appear in an area unchecked, it does seem like they could very quickly grow to the point where they would consume the entire planet. We see in a few instances that a large number of Dementors is able to overwhelm even skilled magic practitioners. Imagine they were just spreading uncontrollably on a remote island for a few years, and then suddenly 10 million Dementors just showed up. It would be over. GG humanity, better luck next time. Speaking of better luck next time, why didn't Voldemort just use the Dementors in the first place? Or rather, why didn't they decide to side with him earlier? It seems like there would have been super useful in taking over the world and whatnot. He seems to rather easily take control over them later in the series. you think he would have been able to do that when he was at the height of his power, right? The counter for this might be that his ego stopped him, I guess. That he felt he was unstoppable and so didn't really plan super well for the Wizarding War. I guess that might explain it, but in the process it kind of turns Voldemort into an idiot, doesn't it? While he might have a bias and blindness towards love magic and plot armor, he wasn't supposed to be stupid or bad at planning. We know that he was an exceptional student, so it seems surprising to me that he wouldn't have been able to better take advantages of the resources at his disposal. I'm not going to solve it here, but I'm sure all of you have thoughts and comments. So, if you made it this far, why don't you click the like button, leave a comment below on what form your Patronus would take, or what do you think about any of these theories? Like I mentioned at the very beginning, I want to start a series of these types of deep dives, and hopefully I'll be able to put out some more videos more consistently, but these do take a very long time to write, voice, and edit. And I know you all appreciate the effort that goes into them, I just want to be able to keep it up. So, above all else, the absolute best thing you can do to help the channel grow is to watch another video. That tells YouTube that my channel is worth promoting, and it'll help it grow. If you liked this video, you'll probably like a lot of other content on my channel, to be honest, so they're probably on the screen right now. Go check them out. With that, thanks again for watching. I'll see you next time.